but many of those shifts we had started to make as a school before we adopted the Common Core, just in terms of understanding our own practice. Um, it really is going for understanding, which means that you can apply it in different contexts. You're not just locked into, I only use this in math, in my math classroom, and what's the point, and how is this relevant to me? Because it really is about having deep understanding so you can apply it in a variety of contexts. There are also major shifts in English in terms of the Common Core. One of the biggest and probably more controversial aspects of the Common Core for I think English language arts teachers is there's a real there's a real emphasis on informational text, reading nonfiction. We tend to think of English classes just literature, and what the Common Core is saying is. English is a nonfiction text and it's a literary text. And we need to teach kids to read and understand nonfiction text as well as we do literary texts. Because as adults, what do we spend most of our time reading? We spend most of our time as adults and in university reading nonfiction. So it's asking for a balance between the two. Whereas before there was largely very little emphasis put on informational reading and nonfiction text. And now there's an emphasis on understanding it, decoding it, writing it. Um, and that's a very big shift. There's real three that narrow the focus on genres of writing. Three main genres of writing that cycle up from ES to MS to HS. And in fact, it's argument writing that the SAT has already, this is where when you look at the new SAT, you can really see the influence of the Common Core on the SAT, because the SAT is saying the writing portion of the SAT now will be argument writing and evidence-based. That comes directly from the Common Core. We want to use evidence in writing, and we want to use it to write in three different kinds of writing genres. Close reading of text. One of the things, how many of you guys middle schoolers, your kids are big readers, and they just tear through books? We like to call them clock junkies. Because they're like, they're like, I totally read the Hunger Games in like a day. And I'm so understanding. <laughs> they do not. That's not close reading text. So one of the emphasis is, is to like slow down, read for comprehension, read for understanding, make connections so that we're not just blowing through books like little plot junkies. Okay, because that's reading, but that's not necessarily literacy in terms of what does the reading mean, what are the indications, what's the message, what's the subtext that the author has, has for me. And the other really big thing that I personally love in my role as curriculum, because I don't work in just math and English, I work with science and I work with social studies. I think one of the really best messages that the Common Core is sending is that we all are responsible as teachers for teaching literacy. And that literacy doesn't just reside in an English class, that for me as a social studies teacher, I'm responsible for helping my kids become better readers of my content area. And so there are very well articulated expectations for what does literacy and writing look like in science? What does literacy and writing look like in social studies? So it's reached out to those other subject areas to give those teachers really strong targets around reading and writing. Which, and as a social studies teacher, which I was one, we never had anything like that. And when we take these things to our teachers, especially in the high school, for them, we do kind of like, the first time we sit down and we look at it, they're like, this is so great. Like, I know exactly what I should be doing when Mostly, you know, if you're doing social studies writing, you're doing it off of what you know and what you did or what you know kids are going to do when they get to the IP. You're working backwards rather than have an articulated program. But now, because of this emphasis on moving beyond just math and English, it's really supporting our literacy, reading, and writing work in other disciplines. I know some of you will probably be curious about standards-based grading reporting, and Beth will be emailing you later. We are doing a probably do a couple of really big parent presentations on standards-based grading and reporting. But for those of you who don't know, standards-based grading and reporting is reporting out student learning based on the standards. 
Well, our standards are the common core. And because we have, for the first time, really clearly articulated standards, it's part of what's going to make standards-based grading and reporting. It's easier, it's more doable. Um, standards-based grading and reporting is a very big movement in the United States as well. And for a lot of people, common core and standards-based grading are kind of going hand in hand. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. That'll be sometime in, sometime in May. So I hope that you all come back for standards-based grading and reporting. All right, so common core of the media. Uh, and this, to me, is actually one of the things that's been most interesting for me to watch unfold over the past three years of when it first came out. Um, I admit it, I use Twitter. I like Twitter, I like following hashtags, and so I've always followed the Common Core hashtags. And I used to be able to find like fantastic resources in there, people sharing what states were doing, people blogging about their implementation, what was working, what did they like, what was hard, what was easy. So following these things on Twitter was a huge resource for me as a curriculum director to find out how the implementation was going in other states. I can no longer follow Twitter about the Common Core, because I can't find anything out there that helps me do my job. Because pretty much what Twitter is filled with is it's filled with criticisms of the Common Core. There is a huge backlash going on in the United States against the Common Core uh, and, and what it stands for. So I want to kind of talk about, from my perspective, what really are these big issues about the Common Core in the United States, because it's Three things that you will hear as a theme over and over and over again when you read about the Common Core in the newspaper, if you decide to follow the Common Core on Twitter, it's just hashtag Common Core. You'll find lots of stuff out there about it. But there's a lot of real negative press out there about the Common Core right now. And I would say the issues are three. Negative press is about its implementation. A lot of states threw these documents at their teachers and they didn't support them. They didn't support their understanding. They didn't support them with unit development. They just had an expectation that, oh, here you go, here's the Common Core, now change. Or we'll sit you down for a three hour meeting and we'll explain it to you and go forth and make it happen. Well, that's not a successful implementation plan. Whereas our implementation plan has been three years, consultants, learning, we've done book studies, you know, in our different departments to understand what are the implications, what are the implications for our work. We've tried to be thoughtful, and we're much smaller. We're not, you know, a state trying to implement this, so it makes it a little bit easier for us to do this. So what's an issue is really, for a lot of states, unsuccessful implementation, very poor implementation of the document. The assessments are increasingly becoming a very big issue. The assessments are expensive. They are, a lot of people see it as really the corporate nature of US education, that all of this money is gonna be directed at these corporations that states are now gonna to have to pay to take these tests. There, some of these tests require computers. Not all schools have one computer for every child or have the resources to do this. So the assessments are also a very big issue. The cost involved in them, and the simple fact is, if you're coming from a state that had very low standards, and you're moving to the Common Core, which has some of the most rigorous standards, there are only there's like one state that didn't take the Common Core because they thought their standards were better. That's why ever I think it's uh, Minnesota took didn't take half of it, and Virginia, and Virginia didn't take them either because they think they believe, and they're probably right, that their standards are stronger than the Common Core. The other couple of states who didn't take it, three of them, it's politics. Which is one of the other really big issues here, is just politics. So the assessments, if you're coming from a state that has very low, had very low standards, and if you're looking at a program that is supposed to be like through a 12 year cycle of education, and you implement it and two years later kids start taking tests that are much more rigorous, what's gonna happen to test scores? And that's what's gonna happen to test scores. It's what happened in New York when New York piloted the first tests. And so New York now doesn't wanna take the test, not yet. So a lot of people, when you hear, oh, they're pulling out of the Common Core, read a little bit further, mostly what they're pulling out of is the assessments of the Common Core. 
I'm not sure right now that I know any state. There are lots of petitions, but nobody's actually pulled out of Common Core implementation. Some of them are pulling out of Common Core assessments because one, the kids aren't going to do very well, and they're very, very expensive. But it doesn't do any so basically, you know, we, and actually the interesting thing is for us internationally, we cannot take the assessments in the United States. They are for states, they are not for international schools. So there are two major consortias for tests. One of them is Smarter Balance, and Smarter Balance is going to do, and correct me if I'm wrong, Smarter Balance and Park. Smarter Balance is going to do the end of course and end of your tests. Park is going to do a map like test, formative. And so you can monitor as they go along through the year. We can't take either one of those. You know, and we're also in a situation as an international school, we select our tests, we're not under the testing regime of the United States. We take the Common Core alignment on the test. So we can pick versions in MAP and we take the Common Core MAP version. So we've been taking this is our second year, taking the Common Core MAP version. So we've been taking it for a little while. I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it. Sorry, I'll speak up a little bit. If, um, if the state is adopting the standards and hence the curriculum, um, do they differentiate uh, between schools that are public or private and the funding? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and answer your question, but I want to say that I, I, I'm going to take something that I know from about private schools and apply it to this question. I don't absolutely know the right answer to your question. Private schools are on their own. They can select their own curriculums. They're not mandated by the state. They can also employ teachers who don't have teaching credentials. I'm sorry. So I there's a stop. lot of freedom. There's a lot of freedom in a private school. And, and, they, don't get and they and they don't get money. They don't get money. Okay. So the other big issue here is politics. And as I said before, you know, I think this really actually goes back to the Constitution of the United States, where we have very clearly articulated rights of what belongs to the federal government and what belongs to the state government. You know, the federal government means money. Because we learned from the Articles of Confederation, it wasn't good to have 13 colonies with 13 different kinds of money. So when they did the Constitution, they gave minting money to the federal government. They gave education to the states. So the way the Common Core sort of unfolded is through the National Governors Association. The Obama administration put a lot of money behind it and a lot of money to incentivize adoption. So people, some people in the states, feel like it's an infringement on states' rights. Because if they didn't join the Common Core, then they didn't get the money. And so there was, a, there was money leverage there. So there's a lot of things that you hear about the Common Core that are about states' rights, the government interfering in how we teach our children, and in of interfering with what they learn and determining what they learn. So this is really, I think from some political perspectives in the United States, seen as a top-down authoritative move that violates states' rights, basically. So there's a lot of political stuff, so when you listen, those are usually the three things that you'll hear. You hear very little about the content and the quality. Most people, when you hear them talk about, or if they, if they criticize the content or the quality, it's usually pretty small things. It's like, oh, they needed more stuff about 21st century learning. Or they don't like the, the emphasis on nonfiction texts. It's usually not like, let's dismiss the, the document as a whole. It's generally seen as a vast improvement over what most of us have. Okay? I'm almost done. So from our perspective, it's, it's good for us in a lot of different ways. We think it's good for our students because it provides them a kind of sequential curriculum. It's really great for our teachers. We know what kids learn before they came to us, and we know what's expected of them when they leave us. We think it's great for you as parents because there's an awful lot of resources out there to help you learn about math and about the new writing genres that are in the size. You know, so there's a lot of resources out there to support parents, and I'm going to show you a resource page in a little bit that helps you find some of these. There's a lot of resources out there for you as parents to understand these curriculum documents. And we think it's good for international schools because 
I actually just got a, I received a survey recently that someone sent out to, and probably 60, 70 international schools responded, and 90% of us are on the common floor. So it's good for our kids from international schools because increasingly it reasonably seems that when you leave here in seventh grade, you are most likely going to another international school, going to be in a common core environment, and you will have had what you needed to have in seventh grade to be prepared for eighth grade there. So our work today, I'm real quick, I'm almost done. Uh, our work today is, you know, we're still busy learning. This is very much, you know, a work in progress for us. It's only our third year of implementation. Uh, like I said, we just ran a reflection protocol at 4 o'clock this afternoon. And I, I mean, for me, it was very powerful to listen to the humanities teachers talk about how much better they felt this was helping them do their jobs. All of us have functioned in environments where the standards weren't very helpful as professionals. And we're now functioning in an environment where the standards very much help and direct our work. And I think we all feel like we're doing a better job because of it. There was very little concern about our implementation. You know, there was more things about what standards-based grading reporting look like. I mean, those are, we're, are we're just in a different place. Like, this is something we've been doing for a while. And it's been a very positive implementation for us. I think we've seen very positive impacts on our practice and, and our ability to know what kids are supposed to know and how they're doing. Um, we're still doing unit revision. You know, in math and in English language arts, we're constantly reflecting, we're constantly improving our assessments. Sorry, this somehow when I transferred this over, uh, didn't pass. We're moving into conversations into some of the other academic areas. We have actually just this year adopted the national, the next generation science standards, which comes out of the same effort as the Common Core, and it aligns to the Common Core in English, and it aligns to the Common Core in math. So there's not being something expected of a sixth grader math-wise they're not learning in the Common Core, if you're a Common Core school. And we will later on look at, in the coming years, social studies, PE, music, art. A lot of our national standards are basic being revised, and we just keep moving along basically our curriculum cycle. So this is a good resource for you, which as I buy more things or I have more things, I will put this for here down for you. We just kind of repurpose the site. Um, and it's just tinyurl forward slash AES parents. It's just a Google site. And there's also, this is where we use for our portal for standards based grading and reporting. So for some of you who have some questions about that, there's a ton of resources up there already about standards based grading and reporting. And I've loaded in the past couple of days a lot of resources about the Common Core, some videos that you can watch, some parent resource sites about what it is that some places that you can go to learn more about the Common Core and how to support your children. Yes. Websitemeets.com before the slash. Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. It's tinyurl.com, sorry. Forward slash AES parents. I guess it seems so natural to put it, but I didn't think about it later. I'll put it in the parent newsletter. Yeah. <laughs> and I will change this on my presentation <laughs> on that website. <laughs> um, and so, really, I just want to open it up to you for any kind of questions that you have and any answers that I can try and provide. And I really would like to invite like, Scott and Alexa, Jessica and Beth, because Scott's you know, in the math department. A lot of us have gone through this implementation as teachers. And you have your hand up first. So I'm going to one, two, three. Does the Common Core, do the Common Core standards refer also to the new system within each of these areas, or is that like a teacher or a It's, there are parts. Question, yeah. Yes. She asked, do the Common Core standards refer to technology? Um, and in fact, for some people, this is actually a criticism of the Common Core. Some people wanted to see more reference to technology in them. In math, I don't think that there's very much in terms of tech, but it's related to tools. Scott, do you want to say anything about yeah, that? Yeah, um, I'm Scott Hahn. I teach middle school math. It's my fourth year here. So what it'll say, for example, on our geometry unit is we have to have them do a reflection. We can use paper and pencil. We can use any level of technology that I think it's, again, open and suitable, as Stacy said. Some schools don't have every kid with an iPad. So I've had my kids doing it with a compass. We've had them using you know, what we call pad paper they can see through. We've also had them doing it on an app. So a variety of choices. It doesn't require it, but I think it tries to encourage it. And in English language arts, there's a big standard in each one of them about engaging in like multimedia projects, different text types, and that's where it's talking about 
things that are really what we would call more 21st century learning, whether it was tools or not. But it's just different mixed media genres, and it's those places that. Um, the reason I ask that question is because although I'm seeing you know, the spiraling of the curriculum, and this is my daughter in the grade, every teacher seems to have a different use of a preference. Right. So I imagine before I ask that question that they may not be, you know, use that technology may not be a part of it. And really, and this is a really good point about the, our relationship as teachers and professionals to the standards. The standards tell me what kids need to be able to know and do. They don't tell me how I have to demonstrate it or how I have to teach it. Okay. So that's that's my job as a professional, how I put that educational experience together for your children. And it, it's absolutely true that one teacher may be using this piece and another teacher's exploring this piece. Absolutely true. Number two. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say part of that technology piece is comparing different types of media. Part of the technology piece is comparing different types of media. So you can look at um, print form versus video form versus that. So it engages in some critical literacy where they're looking at the different types of where they're getting it. So it's not like, oh, YouTube, first thing, I'm going to watch that or, you know. So it gives them some of those tools and skills. Yes? I know this is focusing on middle school. Um, one, you know, it's time before we roll out for all grade levels in one. Is integrated math the common core part of, um, yeah. of, of the common core? And number three, how does it feed into the IT program? Okay, so three questions. I'll take the first one. Is, is this K-12? Yes, this is K-12. Standards overall basically tell you what a kid is supposed to be able to know and do by the end of 12th grade. So schools adopt standards K-12. So we are common core K-12. Your second question was about integrated math. Integrated math. There are different pathways. Um, the Common Core articulates two pathways in the high school. One of them is a traditional math sequence. The other one is an integrated math sequence. We have chosen the integrated math sequence because it helps prepare the kids for IB as well. Because IB is the next step in that integrated math series. And in fact, the IB is actually going through a lot of reflection and revision revision right now in line with the Common Core, because people may not realize this, that even though the, the IB is international, it's seen as you know, the most international program, the largest number of tests given are in the United States. The United States is the largest client of the IB, largely because we never had curriculums, and we needed a curriculum. So schools adopted the IB, because it gives you a full two-year curriculum in high school, and you know if you're 9 or 10, exactly where you're going, so it helps shore up your 9 10 classes. So the largest number of tests given for the IB are like double in the United States over anyone else. So they are also in a process of reflection and revision to become more in line with the Common Core. It's driving 300, it's a nation of 300 million people, lots of money thrown at textbooks, tests. It's driving a lot of change across systems. Scott? Can I just jump in and add to that answer? The high school has a choice between a traditional and integrated pathway. Middle school math is an integrated pathway. We, we don't have a choice. Right, and, and in the elementary school. Which, school I school. Think is a, which I think is the I right choice, yes. but it's, there's, it's, no, it's there's the not an option. Yeah. 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 I, you know, I actually don't know. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. She said it's predominantly, I'm sorry, it's predominantly public schools in the United States. So, I mean, I, if your state has adopted it, you don't have a choice. So you would be common core if your state adopted it, but I don't I don't have as much reading or information about private schools. I think some Catholic schools might have, but like, Early in 2011. 